It's time now for Harm Reduction. Heard every Tuesday at 7 p.m. with Will Beaton. Cutting Edge Radio, where we'll ask the questions others don't want to ask. Now here's your host, Will Beaton. Hey everybody, welcome to the Harm Reduction Report. I am super excited to share with you some audio that Cal and I recorded in Baltimore at the Students for Sensible Drug Policy Conference just last week. Uh, our panel, it'll all be described in the, in the audio here, so I should probably just let it run, but we're going to be talking about confidential informants, which is something we've talked about before on the show, uh, specifically about Andrew Sadik, who was a North Dakota college student who was coerced to go undercover and work for police, tracking down and creating new drug dealers out of people on campus on his last required buy with this arrangement he had worked out secretly with police he disappeared and was murdered um, Andrew's law now was passed in the North Dakota legislature and uh, some of that will be discussed by the attorney who worked with the Sadik family as well as a new friend of ours called Matthew Fogg and we'll cut to the audio now thank you I'll introduce our speakers the first thing I want to just point out is that the original title we had for the talk was Learning from the Deaths of Andrew and Rachel. But we realized that um, that didn't feel right. And so now you see it's Learning from the Lives of Andrew and Rachel. And just in framing it that way, I've suddenly realized how many other lives were impacted by those stories, including the people on the panel and uh, a lot of people here. So I'm excited to be here chatting about this and thinking about it for a long time. Um, I'll just quickly explain who we got here up at the table with me, and then I'll maybe let them introduce themselves and at any time throw out questions and we can just chat as we go. Um, so first, right next to me is Lance Block. I am super excited to see you in person finally. We've chatted on the phone. Um, Lance was the attorney who wrote Rachel's Law and he also came to North Dakota and wrote Andrew's Law, the original uh, draft of it, and he's worked on this confidential informant reform. Um, perhaps the Rachel's Law was the first such law, uh, some of the first initiatives to reform confidential informant policies. You were sort of spearheading that, and you interviewed all over the place on TV about it, and you're really passionate about communicating this stuff. And you're a lawyer and you've done all kinds of great things as so, well. Uh, you can explain more about that if you wish. Um, I'd rather you do that. <laughs> well, uh, Lance is really great. That's what I know. Um, That'll do. <laughs> um, also, I, I just met Matthew Fogg a few minutes ago outside. Um, he's sitting with me here. I'm going to read a little bit about him. He's a retired Chief Deputy United States Marshal. Uh, he also is a speaker for Law Enforcement Action Partnership. Um, which is a nonprofit group that has law enforcement communities talking about uh, ways to sensibly reform drug policy and things like that. Uh, he's also the second vice president of BIG, Blacks in Government, which is a world class organization comprised of federal, state, and municipal government employees. Um, he is from Washington, D.C., where he works now, and I'm really excited to have both of you here. Um, so, I think basically what we're going to do is talk about the stories of Andrew Sadik and Rachel Hoffman, and, uh, but use that as just a lens through which to see the bigger thing of confidential informants. And we have a uh, law enforcement perspective here, as well as more information about those two stories. And uh, I'm really excited. I'm just going to try to ask some sensible questions, but that's what you all are here for, too. So throw them out whenever they come to mind. Um, perhaps I'll let Lance introduce himself a little more, or, explain uh, what this topic means to you, and we'll go from there. Happy to. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here. Um, <clears throat> I'm a civil trial lawyer from Tallahassee, Florida. No law enforcement background. And um, I've been practicing law about, let's see, 20, can you hear me? All right. So I've been practicing law about 26 years personal injury, wrongful death cases. Uh, and in uh, May of 2008, a story broke in Tallahassee, and it was a front page story for a long time. And it was the death of Rachel Hoffman. She had gone missing, and uh, 
No, of course her friends knew why she was missing. Her friends all knew that she was doing this drug deal because she told everybody. Uh, she was totally, and, and by the way, Rachel was a member of this organization and a very proud member of this organization. Rachel liked to smoke pot and uh, my son who was in college with her said that she had the best pot in town. <laughs> and uh, she, uh, her father called her a connoisseur um, and uh, she had quality pot, she bought enough to where she could support herself with it and then sold small amounts of it to her friends. But about a month after her death, uh, I got a call from her mother. And at that point, uh, the story was still uh, very celebrated in Tallahassee uh, with a constant stream of you know, daily statements by the police department blaming her for not paying attention to what they told her to do and claiming that they had, um, that the police department, that is, had uh, complied with all of its policies and procedures. And her mother called me and asked me if she could meet with me. And uh, to make a long story short, I agreed to represent them and flew down and met with her father. And uh, I knew nothing about confidential informants, the CI system. I had been an assistant public defender when I first started practicing law in Miami. And the only thing I knew about CIs is they were snitches. <laughs> and uh, they were not to be trusted. And, um, <clears throat> you know, many of them had credibility problems. And what debate there was about confidential informants up really until the Rachel Hoffman case was uh, whether or not CIs were worth having in the criminal justice system because they weren't reliable, they were motivated to lie in order to help themselves, and law enforcement would use them to do anything in order to gain access uh, to an investigation in a case. Well now, uh, and I'm no expert on that, but I do think I'm an expert on the safety aspect. Because now there's this new movement. It's not about attacking the credibility of the CI. It's about protecting them when they go undercover. Because make no mistake about it, and, and I, know, I know my friend here will tell you, uh, this is highly dangerous work. Putting a wire on, and going to drug dealers, and uh, you know, there's a saying in the drug world, a dead snitch can't snitch. And uh, they live by a different code, you know, some of these guys. Uh, they can't, if they know you're snitching on them, there's no justice system they can take you to for lying on them and cheating on them. Uh, they take, they have their own code of justice. And um, ultimately, that's what cost Rachel her life. So when her parents came to me, they said, we want to do three things. We want you to hold the city accountable for using our daughter like this. And number two, uh, we want your help in whatever way you can give it, guidance as we go through the criminal justice system uh, and these two men who killed her are prosecuted. And number three, and most importantly, we want your help in writing a law um, that will help make sure this doesn't happen to anybody else. So that was my assignment. And um, it's been really, you know, I've had my share of causes over the years, uh, sexually abused victims, uh, you know, people who've been sexually abused and educational centers and so forth, and developmentally disabled rights. Um, I've represented a number of cases in that regard, but this is my cause. Now, this is why I went, this is the type of thing why I went to law school, I and mean, it's been my cause for 10 years. I did the Hoffman case. Um, we wound up with a $3 million settlement we were picking, while we were picking the jury. Um, and the Sadik case, um, I've been involved in that, but I'm no longer representing the family. And if we have time, I'll tell you that story. Uh, but um, 
I've, done, I've been doing other cases as well. And they don't all involve, you know, cute college crooks, you know, or nice college boys. Uh, a lot of these cases involve uh, severely, pathetically addicted people on the street um, who could care less about working off charges. They just want to get, you know, the next fix. And law enforcement will give them the money to go get that fix if they'll go target people that law enforcement would like to get. And when you wire up someone who is a pathetic drug addict and who is desperate, you know, to stay high, or you wire up, like I have a case right now in, in Tallahassee involving a woman who um, was married and well taken care of by her husband, um, but she's, uh, she was uh, uh, paranoid schizophrenic, bipolar disorder, and her husband says, and I haven't seen records, but her husband said she was a multiple personality. And um, she was uh, pawning off all kinds of things they had. She would do anything to get money uh, she was so sick, though, that law enforcement, the law enforcement agency that was using her to go out and buy drugs had Baker acted her on multiple occasions. Now, these are people that just don't have the kind of judgment to be going undercover. He'll tell you, not every law enforcement officer is qualified psychologically, physically, nor trained to go undercover. This is, this is the most highly dangerous police work, and yet we are sending civilians, untrained, some of them mentally ill, some of them addicted to drugs without judgment, without any defenses, and putting them in very highly vulnerable situations in order to do what? Make an arrest? Why is that important? Why is it important that we have all these arrest statistics? And drugs, and why is it that we only use civilians in un going undercover in drug cases? I mean, we don't use civilians to go undercover in a murder case. We don't use civilians to do rapes and robberies. We don't even use civilians to write parking tickets for community service because it's police work. But we're using civilians to do this, and the question is why. And when I first took this case. Rachel's mother, um, who's a very free spirit and was very proud of her daughter's uh, participation in this organization, said to me, you know, Lance, this is about the war on drugs. And, you know, here I am, I'm a greedy trial lawyer, and I'm saying, nah, this ain't got nothing to do about the war on drugs. This, this law enforcement agency messed up in this case. There were 20 police officers out there with your daughter, a DEA plane, and they lost her. And she got murdered by two guys who never intended to sell her any drugs. They had a gun and they were there to rob her with that gun. Uh, this ain't about the war on drugs, Margie. But as time unfolded, I began to finally grasp what y'all have been saying. Uh, the war on drugs is killing people, you know? And you're not, they're not helping people get off drugs. And when they're sending people like Sarah Basham in West Virginia, who's a pathetically addicted opiate addict, uh, out to buy drugs from a former, you know, federal convict who's got a history of violence, but, you know, in drug-related cases, and they're sending her out there, and she gets shot to death five times, and her body's found on the railroad tracks on the west side of Charleston, West Virginia. Uh, they're, they're not getting her off of drugs. That's not what the war on drugs is about. That's not what police work is about. I always thought police work was about basically protecting people from harm, right? Public safety, protecting people from harm. But when we're sending people like Rachel Hoffman and Sarah Basham and Andrew Sadich out there to do undercover work, we're subjecting them to harm. It's a total contradiction of what the purpose of law enforcement is about. So 
Um, that's the way I see it in a nutshell. You know, I can go into the details of these cases. Uh, one of the things that makes Rachel's case unique, a bit of a freak as I say, um, is that Rachel was actually killed in the midst of a police operation. I mean, they were out there, they were staged in various places, they had uh, a wire, you know, in her purse, which it shouldn't have been in, um, and they found, the bad guys found it because it was a robbery, so where do they go? The first place they go is the purse, and, ah, there's the wire. And uh, the man who shot her um, admitted that he shot her because he was angry and he saw that she, she was carrying a wire. But there was a DEA plane there. Um, most of these cases, you know, most of these tragedies are, are revenge, retaliation, murders, uh, where the target finds out that the snitch is snitching and employs, you know, the golden rule, a dead snitch can't snitch. And so most of these cases uh, you know, are along those lines. I've got some things I'll suggest to you, um, you know, maybe take a look at uh, some articles and that kind of thing, get better educated on it, better understand it, but I'll, uh, I'll turn it over to Matthew. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, I, I'm curious, um, from the law enforcement perspective now, maybe some of these questions, why is it this happens? Maybe you might know, right. why does it come to this sometimes? And well, the question we're all asking here is, how do we end it? Well, first let me introduce myself, give them a little background Please. on me. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm from this area, by the way, both from Washington, D.C. Uh, did 32 years in law enforcement as a United States Marshal. Chief Deputy rose up the ranks. And the reason why, I, reason why I got promoted to chief is I had to fight the internal system uh, for racism. I took on the Justice Department, went all the way and got a decision, a $4 million break. In, U.S. District Court in Washington, D.C. And you got to picture this is just for racism behind the badge. I'm writing a book. I sit in my car down for most of you guys. Uh, the book is titled Biggest with Badges. You can imagine what that would be. <laughs> but uh, the, the, in, in understanding me and my career and how I got it, involved in DEA and informants and stuff, dealing with the war on drugs, and certainly I'm definitely against the war on drugs. And, I'm with the uh, law enforcement partnership that we're, you know, we were formerly law enforcement against prohibition. So we, our whole uh, persona and, you know, goal is to uh, give people an understanding why the war on drugs is a failure, a total failed policy. And I think everybody in this room would agree to that. So I don't need to, you know, instruct you guys on that. So, but the reality of it is, is that for me, uh, making that decision to challenge the institution, as I did, sort of goes hand in hand with why I'm here today because I began to challenge the institution, the, the normalcy, what we call it, of how we do our job. And once I got on the inside and I began to see what was happening, I guess you could say in a lot of ways I became a confidential informant. Because once you go against, you know, Goliath, the institution, now you're the bad guy. They can, can easily change that scenario. Now, going back a little bit to understanding informants and how I got into that, once I got assigned to the Drug Enforcement Administration, DEA, I was still a U.S. Marshal, but they put me on a task force and then they made me the supervisor of a particular group. Probably one of the first times the U.S. Marshal became the supervisor of a group, group supervisor of a DEA task force in Washington, D.C. In that, that's when I began to learn how to, you know, we dealt with informants in the marsh service for fugitive operations, mainly, you know, getting people to, you know, tell us where somebody is. And it's not as, it's nowhere near as intricate as you're trying to make a particular case, a drug case, in trying to get an informant, because that informant now has to, you got, it's a, it's a whole, it's a whole different ball game of the, the policies and procedures that we have in place to control that operation, make certain that what happened in this situation that we were just talking about doesn't happen where you can protect, but it's very difficult because when you're talking about handling people who uh, inform us and, and make it, let me make this very clear. DEA, their policies and their procedures for handling informants was very intricate. I mean, you had to have two people when you dealt with the informant, you had an informant file that was under lock and key by the supervisor, myself, the only people could go in that file was when I would allow them to go into that file. We had uh, uh, 
various, uh, uh, what do you call it, processes for making sure that process was, was done correctly. So we, we, had a, a situ we had things in place to protect the informants and to protect people. Because see, one thing about an informant is, really to be honest, and I've seen this, I saw it with my own eyes after I began to see how people were handling informants. You know, informants, you can, you can go on a witch hunt with an informant. You know, literally, I can get somebody that's been what we call tried it, tested, incredible, to point you and say, yeah, she sold, he sold me some drugs, or we were over here and we did this. And because in one of our operations, if I really want to get you, maybe you have been out there involved with these people, but maybe not to the level where you're committing felonies and crimes. But if I really want to get you and lean on you, I can get a confidential informant to give me information that can give me the probable cause to go do something, go in your house, check your car, stop you, you know, search as incidental to arrest at the right moment, all of these things. So it's so much you can do with informants. That's their job. Now, let me, let me, let me, let's be clear on this. Prosecutors, whether they're district attorneys, United States attorneys, we couldn't, let me tell you something, prosecutors and law enforcement could not get the job of investigations and so forth done without having informants or witnesses. That's another terminology. I mean, you gotta have somebody that can tell you about what's happening on the inside. So a lot of times when we would get these guys, you catch somebody and they know they're facing time and so forth, that's one of the things you can hang over their head. I need you, if you want us to make a, a profit to the prosecutor to, to get your time reduced or say that you was helping us, you gotta help us, you gotta give us some credible information. So it's all these things involved. It said you got some people that, now, our policies and procedures, you're not supposed to be on drugs. If you got a habit or you still got the drugs in your system and you got to get to them, you, we're not supposed to sign you up as an informant, okay? Now, of course, in the real world, other things have, oh, well, they went to a drug rehab center and they're supposed to be okay now. But the reality of it is some of these people go back it's the same way with our witness protection program. I used to run that, used to do stuff in that program. And, and we tell people, don't go speaking to people. Don't call, make no phone calls, don't get in touch with no one. You in our program, these are the regulations and the rules that we have set up for you to follow. Then we find out that they are out there reaching out to people. I've had to tell witnesses, if I find out you got a hold of somebody and the bad guy show up, I'm running too. I'm not, I mean, I, I'm sorry, you're not gonna put my life in, in that type of thing. Well, the same way with informants. Sometimes informants will do little things, because we have certain procedures, okay, we need you to do this. You're gonna be wearing a body wire. You're gonna do this. We need you to do this a certain way. But the real world is when stuff starts happening, as they say, when the S hits the fan, a lot of things can change on the drop of a dime. Can change at a moment's notice. So when you're handling in confidential informants, I used to have agents who didn't really know specifically how to handle these informants when these informants were getting out of control. And I said, well, man, why did you do this? So why didn't you have them to do this? And they just weren't certain. And then the informant begins to control the operation. Because the informants, a lot of these informants, they, they're narcissistic. I mean, they're, some of them, you know, they got granular sort of mindsets and how they want to be a cop or whatever. And, they, and it's almost like some of them, a lot of them kind of like it. Some of them get into it because, you know, who wants to do this type of thing now except for the ones we got something hanging over their head. And so then they get into it and say, hey, this is, this is kind of exciting. But the point is that you got to point out people who you've been working, who you've been doing bad things with, bottom line is. So that's what your job is about here to do and to get us information so that we can prosecute these cases. The reality of it is though, with the, when you saw it, incorporating that with the war on drugs, I never liked the war on drugs because I saw it as a racist war on drugs. I saw it as a race war because we, we don't have to go in here, we all understand the numbers and we can see the disparity impact and see the difference in who was arrested, who was locked up, everything. Even how we handled informants, even who we went after. I could do certain things in a black neighborhood or, or against people of color that you better not go into some white neighborhood and try to do that same stuff. You could get away with it. 
So once you start adding, adding the disparate impact of your operations, you saw all together difference there. It's just like we're talking today, we're saying, oh, opioids is a drug problem. Well, what about crack cocaine? Wasn't that a drug problem? Just like we're saying guns, we're saying guns now because people are getting killed in, you know, more affluent white neighborhoods, guns are a problem. What about all the black folks that was killed in the inner cities? Y'all know about that, you know, over the years. Guns were a problem then. So what we're doing is, I'm just simply saying, we gotta add race to this thing as well. Even when we talk about what happens with informants and how does our system operate. The bottom line is, I happen to know, the war on drugs, clearly, we shouldn't be bringing informants in to tell about folks who's using drugs and who isn't, and how do we prosecute drug kids, that's absurd. But there are the intricacies of the operation that you just gotta understand that from a law enforcement perspective, we have policies and procedures specifically on how you handle confidential informants to try to minimize danger to the law enforcement officers and to the civilians on the street. But a lot of times those things go awry. Like in this situation, we're saying somehow we had DEA out there, we had law enforcement. I've seen that happen before. I've seen where suddenly something just all of a sudden changed the scenario. Somebody shows up or somebody recognizes somebody. Hey, that guy, so and so. You know, the thing that I always like that, y'all seen that Geico commercial where the guy's sitting in the car, the informant, and they pull up this shirt and all these. Rough looking dudes, they, they sitting on every side of him. They pull his shirt and he got a body wire on him. And he looks, and they all looking at him. You better have a good answer for this one. He says, well, I did, what was it, guy goes, well, how's that commercial go? He says, I did, uh, uh, yeah, I did save money on my, on my insurance. And he said, oh, okay, well, that's all you had to tell us. I mean, the bottom line is, this is very dangerous when we got a wire on you or we listening. I remember one day we were listening to these guys and the guy says, man, you think the feds might be listening? I wanted to break it in and said, hell yeah. <laughs> I mean, what do you think? But the bottom line is, yes, it is dangerous. It is very tricky. We had one of our, we had one of our agents one time, I'll never get this. I said, listen, don't tell this, this informant anything. Let him give us the information because informants can be very smart, they can be very savvy. They can have you thinking they giving you information, but really they're getting information from you and they're going back out there putting it on the street. So you can see how easily people can get hurt out there, especially if you're undercover. This guy, they were going and telling this informant all kinds of, and I had a little process that I used where I found out what they were doing without letting them know. And then I challenged them and they gave me the answer that I needed to let me know that they were they weren't handling it right, and they was giving this informant too much information that could hurt us. It's all of these things because it's so much, it's so much discretion in this. So much, you can't, I mean, you really can't legislate it as the way you really would like to. You could put policies and procedures in place, make sure that whenever we communicate with these informants, the two people that's talking to them, you, you do certain things, but once you get involved with informants, and after that relationship starts, it's like anything else. After a while, you feel like, hey, man, I'm all right with you. We, we got a good thing going. I can get information from you telling me stuff, and I'm trusting you, and I'm not realizing you may suddenly go south on me and may be in touch with someone else that can hurt our operations. So it's all of those things that come into play. And that's why I can understand when you talk about something happening on the street, we all around, but again, if law enforcement, even if we're on the scene, and I've seen informants come up dead where we weren't on the scene, where they mess you up, they do all kinds of things to you. Because like I said, when you talk about that term snitch, you know, y'all hear the expression snitch, get stitches. I hate that term, but the reality of it is, when somebody thinks that you are, you were part of an op a criminal operation and then you're gonna turn evidence on them? Oh man, y'all see these mafia movies and stuff, what they do to people. They do some horrible things to folks. So all I can tell you is that it is a difficult process to try. You gotta always be aware of it. You gotta go on top of it as a manager, as I was. We had an informant file. We have our uh, various, uh, what do you call it, when they come in and they, people over us that would come in and, and, and edit the process, not edit it, but would look at all of our informants, make, make certain that everything was in place. We had oversight on oversight 
for that very reason, and still stuff would get out of control. So again, just from giving you my understanding of it, that's what I did, that's how I, I understood it to be. Uh, we did, I thought, for, one of the things I didn't like about the informant program was, that, like I said, we had so much discretion when it came down to dealing with those folks, and if I really wanted to get you, I could get an informant to say things about you to get me the probable cause that I needed to follow up. So that's one of the things I really didn't like. And then these informants, they have anonymity, where you know, when you got a real confidence to inform, you don't have to put them on the stand. We had a DEA that was created in the early 70s under the Nixon administration, and that's when the war on drugs was proclaimed and launched. But in the mid 80s, uh, you know, with the cocaine violence and so forth, uh, and the crack, cocaine epidemic, uh, and then the death of Lynn Bias. That's right. Uh, and you had Tip O'Neill in Boston, and Lynn Bias was the first round draft pick for the Boston oh, Celtics, sick. and all of a sudden Congress went ape stuff. And they, they enacted these sweeping drug laws and threw billions of dollars into the drug enforcement program um, after that. Uh, there were no hearings or anything. I mean, it, it just happened. Race war. And uh, so that's really when you had civil forfeiture come into yep. the picture, you know, where the police, if they arrest you in your car or they think you're running a drug house, all they have to say is, so they, they take it. Take it. They take it. And the money became, you know, low hanging fruit, just available not only for the DEA but at the state and local levels as well. And that's when, when Rachel's mother said, this is about the drug war limits. I didn't get it until later on when I began to realize, you know, the drug war isn't about drugs. It's about money. This is about money. Law enforcement makes money on the drug war by making large numbers of arrests and justifying those arrests to the funders. There's grants, there are hundreds of grants for law enforcement agencies that are funded not only by through the DEA, uh, but also through private foundations and state governments. And then when the police chief goes to his local uh, commission and says, we had 500 arrests this year, we're up. Uh, 100 arrests, we really have a drug problem in this community. That's why we're using people like Rachel and Andrew on college campuses. It's, it's not because Rachel was uh, Tony Montana. They're not going after Tony Montana's anymore. They're just going after arrests, and it's all about the money. And I, I would highly recommend that you read an article um, in the Sun Sentinel that was done in uh, 2015, I think, and uh, it's the Fort Lauderdale Sun Sentinel. It's called Cops, Cash, Cocaine, How Sunrise, that's a city, uh, police department makes millions selling drugs. It's a fascinating uh, investigative piece that was done in Fort Lauderdale that just puts all of this uh, you know, crystallizes everything that we're talking about here, that this is about money. It's not about getting people off of drugs. It's not about making our streets safer. And uh, it's not protecting people from harm. It's subjecting people to harm. And the other thing I wanted to say uh, about the standards, um, there's no question uh, that the DEA, which has the best standards, right. um, and, and, but in order for a law enforcement agency to be certified, and every law enforcement agency wants to be certified, there are standards on uh, managing a confidential informant, it just says the police officer is the manager, basically, and then there's standards on keeping the file confidential and keeping the name of the CI you know, anonymous. Right. Uh, how interviewing techniques, uh, as the uh, investigation continues and the work with the CI continues, the idea is that it be documented. All of those procedures 
are about protecting the integrity of the investigation and the prosecution. I mean, there's a major entrapment problem in every, every time you use a CI, amongst other legal issues. But they want to have a file that is well documented because in Florida and most states, once, I mean, a CI agrees, they sign an, an agreement and they agree to testify. Right. And so at some point, their file's going to get handed over to a defense lawyer because that defense lawyer's client has a Sixth, Sixth Amendment right to confront the witness against him. And so their anonymity, the CI's anonymity is blown. You know, once we get into to discovery on the case and the dead snitch can become a snitch at that point. But none of these procedures that we're talking about here address how to handle the CI safely. You know, who, who should be a CI? Not every civilian or, or people with mental illness? I mean, these are some of the standards we tried to write into Rachel's Law and Andrew's Law, um, but that has never been addressed by the DEA. That has never been addressed. There are no standards on protecting the safety of the CI uh, in undercover operations on uh, the accreditation levels. And uh, there, uh, you know, of course, every law enforcement agency has standards on how to protect a vice undercover officer when he or she goes undercover. There are a number of things that law enforcement has written into their policies and procedures as to what, they're, what they should do. For example, in Tallahassee, if you're an undercover police officer doing a drug deal, they put a GPS on your car, right underneath your car. And they can track your car wherever it goes. Guess what? Rachel Hoffman's car, she's not a Tallahassee Police Department vice undercover officer. She didn't have a GPS on her car. And she got lost. And if they had a GPS, if they had treated her the same way they treat their own, they wouldn't have lost her. And that's why what we really have tried to do is if you're going to use a civilian to do undercover work, at least give them the same safety standards that you give your own. Just quick add on that. Now, I think in our policies and our procedures, what we utilize is, is techniques that would protect both the informant and the law enforcement officers. There are things that we put in place that we let the informant know you can't do this, you can't do that. There's a thing that they sign that all this gives them, if they follow it the way we tell them to do it, that gives them a certain amount of protection. But there are always those situations where, again, like I said, like we said, like you said, this was a freak of nature thing to hear that occurred, where things that we just can't account for, that's going to happen. So, and trust me, I can guarantee you on that investigation, they looked at everything, every procedure, everything they did to see where they messed up at. Even with the bird dog being on the car, I'm assuming that maybe there was a reason that that wasn't placed with, I don't know. But again, that, and that could have been something somebody overlooked. I mean, that's, those are the things that we find. We find through trial and error that, okay, how, what are best practices? What else can we do now to, to help our situation. Now, we don't have a lot of informants killed. That's a rarity that we get informants that do get actually get killed. But the point is, it has happened before, and we've had agents killed in these operations. So I'm not saying it didn't happen, but, but let me interject something real quick. I always said that the war on drugs was an equal opportunity enforcement operation. We wouldn't be having this subject, this, question, this, this conversation. Do you guys understand what I'm saying when I say that? It was an equal enforcement opportunity operation. It's just like what's going on with guns right now. Right now we're having a discussion, why? Because it's not people being killed in the inner cities by the hundreds, but it's being killed in other places. You, you guys understand that? All I'm saying to you is that when I saw it, and when I was coming along in the 80s and early 90s doing these operations, I saw everything was, uh, when we changed the crack versus powder cocaine, Everything we did was to focus on urban, black, mainly urban areas, and then we see the end result, who's in prison, disproportionate, you know, that you can't even make an argument that maybe 
It just happened that way. You can see this was targeting. This was what I call ethnic cleansing. And when I had a DA special agent tell me, supervisor, tell me specifically, I said, well, look, man, aren't we targeting urban areas? Aren't they using drugs out in Potomac and, you know, some of the more wealthier white neighborhoods? And we had informants that was telling us where the people were coming to get this stuff and where it was going. You know what he told me? He said, Paul, he said, if we go out there and start kicking their doors in, doing the same thing we do in these inner cities, you know what's gonna happen? We're gonna get a phone call. He said, they're gonna shut our operations down because they know judges, lawyers, and politicians. Does that make sense? All I'm saying is, we're having this discussion because certain people are killed. And all I'm saying, because it affects certain people, and what I wish we could do is have the discussion saying, no, if it's happening to anybody, it's wrong. That's what I wish we could do in America, but I don't see that happening. I only see we're now getting all involved in gun rights, drugs and so forth, when opioids, when certain people become affected. And that's what I wish we would all come together and say, no, it's not gonna just happen just cause it's happening to us. Cause just, Check this out, I always say this, the chickens will come home to roost. There's an old expression. <laughs> you know? So y'all got questions, I guess, or whatever. Uh -huh. Yeah, I think we have about 15 minutes or so. Uh, so anybody have a question? Yeah, please. Hi, my question is for you. Yes. Uh, um, so we touched a lot today on, my name is Amy Holder, by the way, and I'm the chapter leader at Paul University in Chicago. Um, so, we talk a lot as drug policy reformers about regulating a black market to make right. the product safer, but mm -hmm. also to make the people involved in the drug transactions safer themselves. Right. And I'm wondering, where do you think the violent component comes from? Because the general consensus in this room is that drug selling isn't inherently dangerous and that there are a multitude of ways to make that process safer right. for both the seller and the individual. So why are we seeing informants being killed? Why are we seeing the code of conduct in black market drug transactions being to kill snitches? Well, I mean, it, it goes back to, if we go back to the mafia type concept, you, you're doing something that is illegal. So it isn't like if somebody takes someone's drugs or somebody doesn't do something right, you can run to the police or you can take them to court. That's just out. So I got to take the law in my own hands. So when you've got folks who are <laughs> counting on these drugs, who are making money off these drugs, and they realize that somebody has done something wrong to them, they're gonna take the law in their own hands, however they do it, whether they shoot you, whether they, you know, whether they do something to your family. So that's always the fallout from it, because it's illegal. You know, alcohol prohibition <clears throat> before it became or they regulated it, you know, it was all kinds of fallout of violence in it. Once they regulated, everybody saw that, whoa, I mean, it's still bad. I mean, it's still bad if you become an alcoholic or you're abusing any, any substance. But the re reality is we found out, we sort of took out that violent aspect of it. So if we could do the same thing with drugs, I think we, we, we have a win-win situation because people are going to, Look, y'all, people gonna smoke, they gonna get high. People, go, they're gonna get their drugs, just like they're gonna get their guns. You know, people say, Second Amendment right, you don't take my guns. We're gonna get our guns. So what we're trying to say now is, well, how can we regulate those guns? You don't need to have an AR-15, you know, you can have, and if you do have a gun, we need to know where it is. Does that make sense? I don't know if I'm hoping to answer. No, completely. I have one really brief question. Sure. Topic. So do you think the effort against is sort of a double-pronged attack? It's like like the effort against violence in the drug trade, do you think it's addressing the race component and also addressing the violence, like removing violence the way we did in Prohibition? They yeah. kind of have to work together. Do I think it's what would you think? I guess just, do you, they are separate but equal. Like we have to, yeah. we have to address both of those components yeah. to go forward. No, no question about it. I think it's, it, you know, they run hand, they coincide, so to speak. You know, and I think if we addressed it like that, I think we we would have major positive results. But there's so many companies that that we just said we talk about. You know, people that are sponsoring these these drug laws and got money wrapped up. It's not just the bad guys on the street, but it's the bad guys in Congress. It, you know, it's bad, the legislators. Everybody's making a, you know, you got people building prisons and private prisons where they all making money. This is slavery in America today. It's, it, that's all it is, it's just a, 
another form of slavery. And this frightening piece of it to me is if we do decide to regulate, say one day we come up, we say, okay, we're going to regulate drugs, we're going to stop all this great. What will America turn to next? Because it seems like that is a trend of America. We want to keep slavery going somehow, some way or another, or will we become a nation where we begin to see each other by the content of their character and not by the color of their skin? Will we ever get to that point? We sure are not there today. We understand that. Uh, I've got a question for Lance. Could you please explain sort of what Andrew's law or Rachel's law were intending to do and did it achieve that exactly? You mentioned that the bills were watered down before they were ultimately passed. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, well, uh, you know, obviously my preference would have been to see legislation that just prohibits the use of civilians mm -hmm. to do police work, undercover police work. And, you know, one of the things, that we, we talk about, we use this term confidential informant rather loosely. A confidential informant is defined as someone who provides uh, confidential secret information right. to law enforcement. Matthew will tell you, information is the lifeblood of police work and police investigations. Right. It's all about acquiring information. Uh, and then that's what we had for many, many years. A CI was somebody who whispered in the ears of law enforcement. And then, as we've talked about in the 80s, you've seen this explosion of using civilians to go undercover in order to jack up the arrest numbers in order to uh, justify uh, you know, the exorbitant funding. Uh, so Rachel's Law and uh, initially Rachel's Law and Andrew's Law, there were uh, a number of provisions, some of which were watered down. I can go through it, but I, don't, I know you all are short on time. But why don't I just give you the statute sites, and then you can take a look at yourself at what, what we've got. And with Rachel's Law, it's uh, Florida Statutes 914.28. And it defines what a confidential informant is, what a controlled sale is, uh, and it provides a number of standards. The key thing in Rachel's Law um, that was lost in her operation because when they lost her, the uh, case manager, the guy calling the shots, did not, once they lost her, they lost the eyes on her, they lost the ears on her, he should have shut it down. He should have said, okay, it's over with, let's go find her. Her, her life is more important than any drug deal. Instead, he waited. And you can, the chatter, you know, amongst them, uh, amongst the law enforcement officers and the station is really, it's just so sad to hear him just wait and wait. They're waiting for her to call. And uh, he's decided that she's going to call him, he's going to find, they're going to find her, and they're going to make the drug deal, and so all is good. He's got 20 cops out there. He's got a DEA plane. And now he loses his informant, and now he's got to shut the deal down. He looks like a fool. Right. They're all working overtime. <clears throat> so that's really what happened. Um, <clears throat> so the key component of both of these statutes is that the safety of the civilian who has gone undercover is of paramount importance and more important than the drug deal. And that, that is the gist. And then there are other standards about who's qualified uh, to be able to do it people with good judgment, people who aren't on drugs, even though they're using people who are right. on drugs, people who aren't mentally ill, even though they're using people who are mentally ill in these other states. So, um, you know, it's good stuff, but it's, it's far more watered down than what we would like. Yeah. Um, so we talked a little bit about how race affects arrest rates right. um, for drug charges. How did, how, I want from both of you, how does race affect the selection of police informants? And how does that affect the way that you treat those informants and, how, and what kinds of situations they get sent into, where they get sent to? How does race affect how you choose informants? Because the informants you're talking about are white. What's the general consensus about what the population of these informants actually is? That's a really good question. That's a really good question mm -hmm. because what I'm seeing and I'm sure Matthew's got a better perspective, but as a civil lawyer, and I'm getting calls from people all over the country, my child's being recruited on campus to be a CIA, he hadn't done anything, okay? I'm not hearing from black parents. 
This is this is this phenomenon on white uh, or on campuses involves white kids, and black kids are getting the opportunity to work charges off. You know, either that or they're smart enough to say, "I'm not going to do it because I know I may get my ass shot off if I do this." But but I, I really think that it is racist in the way people are being selected, and. In Florida, we try to, as part of Rachel's law, we try to require every law enforcement agency around the state that was using CIs to submit data on an annual basis to our state police agency, Florida Department of Law Enforcement Aid. And it would, you know, what kind of charges people were being dropped, brought in on, age groups, race, gender, we were very interested in race. I was working with another lawyer, an expert on CIs on the criminal side of it. And she has, uh, Alexandra Natapoff, very great law professor at Loyola, who's written lots of books on uh, CIs and the abuse of CIs in the criminal justice context. And she has theories that <clears throat> law enforcement officers and agencies are very race selective when it comes to making offers to to whites and blacks disproportionately. And, Any question? And just quick follow up. Just quick follow. Up. Yes, it is on black campuses. It is on black campuses, and they do recruit black folks to do these things. But but there's no saying walking, breathing, <laughs> talking, thinking while black. What does that mean? That simply means. Every statistic that I've looked at in America on every issue that's out there, you see this disproportionate negative effect on people of color. So when you see it with everything, it's the same way with informants. I, I saw it with my own eyes. I mean, the way we even, the money we gave, white informants versus black informants, everything, it was there. So even those students on black campuses, They'll take them and, 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 and it'll force them to do certain things, and a lot of them don't have money to get an attorney, they can't fight, so they just gotta go along with the program. Or they tell you, if you don't do this, you're gonna get five years in prison, you're gonna get, and a lot of them, the, what they did, if it was challenged, it would be thrown out of court. But they don't know that, so they go with the program. And then they get caught up, and next thing you know, they do become an I've had a many come to me and say, man, I was made an informant, a snitch, and I didn't want to do it, but, but they were going to destroy my college career. They were going to do this, and they were going to do that. So I know you got other questions. I know time. Paula, isn't it not also the case that the vast majority of CIs between like 8 and 18 are black and brown? I haven't seen a specific stat on that, but I would virtually have to say yes, because again, that disproportionate impact when we see what happens to black and brown folks. If we could get a number of all the informants, you know, and they say, you know, take the race of them, I guarantee you, you would see that, because I've seen so many cases, and these people didn't even have to be informants, they just, they just take you and tell you anything and make you start giving up information. So, and that's an informant. Once you start giving information, whether you're confidential, whether you're on our rules or what, once you give up that information, you become an informant. Okay. Is a question right here? Um, I feel weird even asking this question, but I'm trying to look at positive outcomes moving forward. So, are there any instances of any uh, police uh, offices or stations doing anything where they have a, a model program for, a, a model program for right. informants, where they're doing things well and right and, I mean, that's kind of hard to think of, but is there an upside to this in any way? Right. Model, model programs are where they don't use people to do police work. <laughs> well, I, I don't know if you could, you know, it's just like witnesses. I don't know if you could really do a war on drugs or any of these, these types of, you know, criminal behaviors without having somebody from the reference group to come in and, and be able to tell you, who, you know, what activities is going on, and whether we want to make them a cop in that. I mean, that's a different story. But I just don't know if you could do it. But but we do have to have. To me, I think there could be some some modifications of the process to make certain that it's done right. Because, like I said, it's so much discretion that once I got you as an informant and I got your credibility, 
I can pick anybody in this room out really to be honest with you if I really want to go after you. So it's, it can be a witch hunt. And then if you talk about a racist, like bigots with badges or something like that, you really got issues. That's all I'm saying. So, you know, it's, 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 it's something that we have to really, I don't, I wish, like I said, I wish the war on drugs didn't exist, <laughs> you know, I mean, I, but, but, you know, we, it's, we stuck with it. I think Neil's got to So, so I have a question. I, I know that the ultimate goal, especially in this, in this space with these wonderful folks, would be to end the war on drugs, to end drug prohibition, period. But we know that that's a long way out. But what would happen if we were to be successful with decriminalizing, as we've done in Portugal, regarding this issue that we're talking about here today? What's your thoughts on that? Same impact. You know, I think if decriminalization would be, go a long ways to, to minimize the stuff that we're dealing with now. I mean, certainly the, the ultimate goal is prohibition. But if we could just decriminalize, yes, because again, as you decriminalize, you're taking out that sort of black market piece to a great degree of law enforcement going after people and your criminal and all of that. So that's that's that may be a, you know the second step if we can't get full prohibition. But I, I would be I would be for it if it had if it, if we had to go that way. Well, uh, we've got one I, minute left. One minute. I'll I'll uh, share with you a little bit more about my story. I'm a recovering drug, out, drug addict and, out, and alcoholic, and uh, I actually, you know, I've been on television with a lot, it's been a very high profile for 10 years, and I was set up by a CI two years ago and arrested by the DEA for trying to purchase a small amount of cocaine, and it was a very interesting experience, uh, to say the least. And, um, as someone who's had a 20-year history of uh, addiction, um, I don't understand why people go to jail for it. Uh, people like me, who, I mean, I've been to treatment, I've been to, I mean, I go to meetings, I have sponsors, I've had sponsees. I don't want to use drugs, but when that obsession takes over, and you. Unless you have been an addict, you don't, I can't, I mean, words can't explain it. Because I didn't understand it for years. Uh, when the obsession takes over, yeah, I, I thought about, I could get arrested here. I thought about, I'm being set up here. You know, I really did. I pulled over twice thinking, am I being set up? But that obsession is so great. I was willing to take the risk. It's cost me business. It's cost me credibility as a lawyer. Um, I had to get off the static case. Um, you know, it's it's been a horrible thing, but it's you know it's it's what I had to go through. You know, and uh, uh, decriminalize. I mean, it, it really is about trying to help people get better. You know, I always thought the war on drugs was about getting people off of drugs. <laughs> and you know, you know, and then when I started doing this kind of work, <clears throat> no, it really right. isn't. It. And that's that's really I, I try to get down to fundamentals. You know, why do we have the police? We have the police to protect us. And when the police are sending civilians out to do their work, or the most dangerous type of the work, they're not protecting us from harm. They're subjecting us to harm. And when the war on drugs is supposed to get us off of drugs or help people get off of drugs, but we're putting them in prison. Uh, we don't have really any type of national uh, uh, rehabilitation programs that are worthy, like you're talking about in Portugal. I mean, people like me know that I'm on my own if I want to get off the drugs. It's hard enough to do it when you want to do it. It's even harder to do it when you don't have the resources. So, if, you know, if we could, and I know we got to finish up, if we could just simply in this room and everybody take this back when you leave here. Ask the question, say to yourself, if I'm going to be concerned about it, I don't need to wait till it knocks on my door. I need to be concerned about it when it's happening to others. Because, you know, that old saying is, sooner or later, the, root, the chickens are going to come home to roost. And when somebody says, well, why is this happening to, you know, I have people, well, look at, 
Why are you doing this to me? Why not you? <laughs> what were you saying when they was doing it to others? We have to understand that. And that's what I just wish America would do. Don't wait until all of a sudden it's happening in Sandy Hook and it's happening in uh, Florida where it just happened. And when it's happening to say something when it's happening to everyone in the cities and we see this canage and we see what the government is doing. Step up. And I know, S I know this SSDP is an organization that is an advocacy organization. You're a great group. I love you guys. I mean, y'all got the looks and the excitement. I love y'all. But just get involved with it all. Thank you. We have a round of applause.